Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jesse Freeston coming to you from our Washington, D.C. studio. Uh, it's one day before the Afghan people will go to the polls to elect their president. And um, we're joined by Nancy Youssef, uh, McClatchy's Pentagon correspondent who recently returned from Afghanistan. So Nancy, I, I want to start with that. The Afghan people, there's been a lot of talk in the media about the legitimacy of this election, various threats to that. Um, will the Afghan people at the end of tomorrow, in your opinion, feel as though they've elected a popular president? Well, I think it depends on how the elections go. It's Right now there are 37 candidates running, um, and they're not really clear. And in a lot of places in Afghanistan, they won't be able to vote because of the security situation. I think right now that's in doubt because, um, first of all, they see that this election, in their mind, will be stolen by Hamid Karzai, the incumbent. They're not hopeful that this, will, uh, that this process will be um, clean. The, there's an independent election commission which is supposed to make sure that it's clean, but the man in charge of it was put in place by Karzai. So even the provisions that we think of, uh, I think from the Afghan view, are, are tainted in a way. There are thousands of um, UN workers coming in to monitor the elections. But I think there's an assumption in Afghanistan that Hamid Karzai, one way or the other, will win this election, either by making deals or stealing the election. And so in that regard, I'm not sure that people will see it legitimately. There's an expectation that because there are 37 candidates running, that there'll be a runoff election. And I think in a way that needs to happen for the Afghans to feel that their vote was counted. And, and, and I think there's also a real sense of um, they're, 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 they're really jaded about how the process, how, what democracy has done for them. And so you talk about some of these deals that, um, that Karzai may or may not make, and we've seen him make some moves with his power as president um, in previous weeks and months. Could you talk a little bit about some of the things he's done, and what does that tell us about Afghan politics? Sure. You know, he'll tell you that being president more than anything is about deal making, and he's reached out to almost every ethnic group and tribal group in the run up to this election, and, and even to the uh, Taliban itself, promising everything small things, positions in his, in his potential cabinet. Um, some would argue land to, to particular people, prom made promises to warlords about what they'll be able to control. And his goal is to get the minority groups, he gets, because he's not just vying for the Pashtun, Pashtun vote, which is the largest majority, but he's hoping the um, other minorities will push him over the edge to give him that 50% plus one vote. Most recently we saw Dostum come back, who is a um, known human rights violator. He was allowed back into the country because he has tremendous sway over the Uzbeks, which is a minority um, group in Afghanistan in the north. And the assumption is that that minority group may be the one that pushes the election in his favor. And so it's been weeks and weeks of wheeling and dealing with every single group and really using his presidential power to to hold sway over, over the other candidates because um, the leading candidates, um, with the exception of one or all posture, and go, vying for the same base um, that, that he is, which is which is in the South. And so uh, the way that we hear about these elections spoken about in the media, it's very different. It's not issue-based. That's right. Um, there's very little talk about what differentiates the candidates, particularly the two main candidates that have talked about being nose and nose, Abdullah Abdullah and Hamid Karzai. That's there's right. very little talk about where they differ in their actual policies and what they plan to deliver. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, that we just saw Hamid Karzai appear in the first presidential debate, even though there have been scores of them. Um, and, and when you go through the streets of Kabul, for example, you'll see posters and cars and in front of people's houses. And people don't assume that that person's being supported because of what they stand for, but because they share an ethnic or tribal connection to the candidate. And, and, the, and the truth is both of those candidates, um, the, both of the leading candidates, they've served in the same government. Abdullah Abdullah was a former minister of foreign affairs. And when you speak to them, I've, I've interviewed Abdullah Abdullah. They, they speak in generalities. We want to get rid of corruption. We want to bring back legitimacy. We want to build up the Afghan forces. We want to, some people talk about a timetable for the withdrawal of American forces and coalition forces, but you don't hear specifics. And it's really become, um, it's reminiscent of Iraq in that it's become uh, as much um, a census as, is, as an election in terms of who comes out and, and who they support. And that, and I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing the, the race so close, because they're not, um, deciding on issues. If anything, this election has become a referendum on Karzai's government. Well, th I mean, the big difference that immediately steps out is, uh, with Iraq is that in Iraq, the United States has a timetable and has determined that they will leave, whereas we see President Obama just a couple days ago um, reaffirm that they're going to stay and stick it out until what he calls Al-Qaeda and its allies are eliminated. But we must never forget, this is not a war of choice. This is a war of necessity. 
Those who attacked America on 9-11 are plotting to do so again. If left unchecked, the Taliban insurgency will mean an even larger safe haven from which al-Qaeda would plot to kill more Americans. So this is not only a war worth fighting. This is, a fun this is fundamental to the defense of our people. And on, on the opposite side, you see uh, Taliban representatives saying, as long as there are foreign troops in the country, the war will continue. <laughs> Is there a feeling amongst anybody in the Afghan population that a presidential candidate, an Afghan president, can bring an end to this seemingly intractable contradiction? I think there's that feeling in Afghanistan that we've had foreign troops in our country for eight years and the security situation's gotten worse, not better. I think all of this, frankly, at the end of the day, is going to lead to a negotiation with the Taliban. You talk about this, this, this right, this dichotomy between what the president's saying, what the Taliban's saying, in terms of how this ends. And you're already starting to see the early seeds being planted by the Karzai government, and I think privately by some of the presidential candidates, that if elected, they will reach out to the Taliban, that, that you cannot win this war over, that you can't defeat or kill your way out of Afghanistan, if you will, or out of the violence in Afghanistan, because th there's always more fighters, there's always more weapons to be had, and that there's no, there's no killing everyone there. There's no, and, and, the, and what's Taliban in Afghanistan anyway? It's such a nebulous term. Um, you know, you'll hear the Pentagon talk about big T Taliban versus little T Taliban. In some ways it's a distinction without a difference because what it says is that they're they're intermixing the population. It's 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 like trying to take an ingredient out of out of out of a, out of a sauce. You know what I mean? It's 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 so part of the community, and so um, I, I think all of this is going to lead to a negotiation with the Taliban. That the ultimate sort of victory is to turn them from an, a, a, a violent organization into a legitimate political one, and I think that's where this is going to have to go. That it cannot this cannot be a war fought on the battlefield. But is there a feeling that the president has the ability to do that? We saw Hamid Karzai recently in the past year announce that regardless what the United States says, I'm going to meet with Mullah Omar. Um, and that still hasn't happened. And so, and, and, and it also assumes that the Taliban would be willing to meet and discuss. And so is, is there really a feeling that the president in Afghanistan has the ability to make that happen? But you know, you know the, the truth is in Afghanistan, there isn't, um, you're right, there's not a hope that the central government can do it. But at, at the Afghanistan that I saw is really based on district by district relationships. And so maybe Hamid Karzai can't do it, but I don't think the Afghan people that I saw are as concerned about a sort of national reconciliation. That, that they've lost such faith in the, in the ability of the central government and the ability of the coalition forces, frankly, that their hope is that in their district, their local leader can, can somehow reconcile with the Taliban in their community and somehow bring some stability that way. That it's not the hopes of a sort of national um, reconciliation have, have long gone. And so the Afghans you hear aren't, they're not as inspired by any of this. They really just want a very local reconciliation. Can my tribal leader, can I negotiate something for myself and for my family and protect them from the threat? Or can I successfully bifurcate myself in these two worlds, satisfy the Taliban and satisfy the legitimate government that's been elected? And that's that's what you see Afghans navigating, not not the not not the central government. Or and I think you'll you see that in the elections as well. You don't hear a lot of optimism that whoever wins can bring substantial change to Afghanistan. What you're saying is sort of in contradiction with how people in the United States view the process in Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, I hear all the time people say that you know the Afghans aren't ready for democracy, and I, I take exception with that. I think I think the democracy that they've gotten hasn't served them very well. Um, remember, it's been eight years for them of coalition troops. Hamid Karzai has been um, president for most of that time, and there's more corruption in their mind than even when the Taliban was in charge. There's more violence. There's less stability. There's there's more freedom in the sense there's more more you don't have to dress as conservatively and you can speak out, but the quality of life for the everyday Afghan is worse, not better, because instead of sort of dealing with the Taliban threat, again they're they're navigating between the Taliban. And, and, the, and the government. You'll hear it, um, soldiers, you know, they talk to the Afghans and they'll say, why do you let the Taliban in your house? And it's because they have no choice. And literally they'll wave to the Taliban and let them in and then wave to the, the coalition forces walking by. They, there's not a sense of stability. It's a constant navigation, a constant sort of maze that they're working through to try to survive. In a way you can't blame them for, as they go into this election, there isn't a lot of hope in all this. They're really, 
I mean, I traveled to Kandahar and to Kabul, and I never heard optimism about this election. To me, it was a, a population that thought that this was a foregone conclusion, that Karzai was going to win, and that their quality of life wasn't going to improve by way of the central government. It was going to improve by figuring out a way in their own communities to survive. And that's where their focus is. I, I didn't hear a focus on the central government at all. You know, we talk a lot about August 20th and the election, but in a way, it's August 21st and the days after that'll be so important. If there's a runoff election, there is a lot of danger with that because the Afghans saw what happened in Iran and they were inspired by it. I think there's a possibility you'll see Afghans taking to the streets as pet if they, particularly if they don't feel like their vote was counted. And if there isn't a runoff election, that's a problem because then they'll feel like the process was cheated, that they were that their vote wasn't counted, that that 37 people ran for president and Karzai somehow got 50 percent plus one. It doesn't seem possible, and so. As a journalist, I'm not watching just August 20th, but what happens after that and how, how Afghanistan holds together and what will be um, an uncertain period no matter, no matter what happens on Election Day. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, we'll be keeping an eye on what happens after the August 20th election in Afghanistan. Thank you for watching The Real News Network.